All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, this is the first session of non-product specific um, information. I'm gonna be talking a little bit about the process. So uh, it's great to choose a system, to specify a system, even to build such a system, um, but to ensure that that is uh, meeting the design objectives and meeting the project requirements um, and meeting the performance requirements um, is key to that whole process. Um, like with modeling, we do a lot of performance modeling, garbage in, garbage out. So you can even specify excellent stuff, uh, but if it doesn't get built, uh, then you'll still suffer the same consequences as if you chose a poor system to begin with. Um, right off the bat, I just want to uh, get the message across that uh, maybe many of you have heard MMM was acquired late last year by WSP. Uh, we are currently in the co-branding exercise, so we're transferring the brand equity, so you associate MMM in your mind with WSP. Uh, so I am now a MMM WSP company. So um, take that uh, into uh, account. Um, WSP is a very large company. I don't need to wow you with statistics. Um, global uh, influence and global presence uh, covering many, many sectors uh, across any type of project that you can imagine. But really the, the thing that um, I'm here to talk about is building and closure commissioning. Uh, so in the midst of a 30 something thousand person company, we have about 200 building science professionals across Canada um, and a fairly large practice here in Ontario. Uh, and one of the things that we do is enclosure commissioning. Uh, and really that is tying together our knowledge of specifying uh, performance of, of enclosure systems, overseeing their uh, implementation and evaluating their quality. We're going to talk about uh, defining enclosure commissioning. We're going to talk about, oh boy, I see what you mean about this super fast clicker. Um, enclosure design challenges, uh, what is commissioning? So you may have heard it for mechanical, electrical, what is it for a, from a building enclosure perspective? Uh, and the benefits of building enclosure commissioning. So the building enclosure is this uh, set of materials, systems that separate two dissimilar environments at the heart of it, so inside from outside. Uh, it can also separate conditioned spaces within one space. So uh, if this room were differently pressurized or if it were an infection control area, it would be differently controlled than the space next to it. So that could also be a building enclosure, building separator. The cladding, whoop, you saw that there for a second. The cladding are these things that are added on the outside as an aesthetic or rain shedding or weather control that are not part of the structure. So I just want to make sure I get those two terms across, the building enclosure uh, and the cladding. Why does the enclosure matter? Uh, while primarily uh, codes demand it, we, are, we have a very strict code in Ontario specifically, uh, very high energy targets. Uh, low window to wall ratios um, and uh, high performance targets for the building enclosure. So the code demands that you, that you uh, meet them. The HVAC and the building enclosure are interdependent. So if you have a poor performing enclosure, it may be perceived that you have a poor performing mechanical system. That might not be the case. Uh, vice versa. If you have a really high performance uh, cladding system and a poor performing mechanical system, uh, there will be a perceived deficit on one or the other. So these are interdependent systems. Um, the HVAC system is dependent on the enclosure and the enclosure is dependent on the HVAC system. Uh, sustainable buildings or high performance buildings or whatever you want to call them often incorporate these new and uh, sometimes differently implemented systems, materials, new ways of doing things. Uh, we had that a couple slides before uh, from Scott Wiley, I think it was, of um, Frank Gehry buildings or even Frank Lloyd Wright buildings or things that we might not see as being the norm. Buildings are becoming complex. Sustainable buildings sometimes are pushing the boundary in terms of what we know as a building closure. Look at this place, for example. Um, you know, this is a relatively straightforward, solid masonry building with punched windows. 
not a lot of complexity. Um, now we're using it differently than what it originally was used for, but anyways, we won't get into that side of things. Uh, and envelope failures are costly to repair and, um, and often uh, sometimes can't even be repaired reasonably uh, or reliably. I clicked. So uh, I mentioned before this performance gap idea. So if we design the mechanical and, and HVAC, or HVAC and building enclosure systems to perform at the same level, and one of them has a, a deficiency during construction or a change, we have this performance gap that we can very rarely make up again. Okay, so why, why are we caring about building enclosure commissioning? I would say expectations are changing. Uh, we don't live in stone huts anymore. Um, uh, we live in more complicated buildings. Uh, as I said before, uh, this building we're in, solid masonry, windows, uh, conventional roof, fa fairly simple building. Um, we have things like now, curtain wall, structural glass, precast concrete, um, vegetated roof assemblies, sloping roofs, uh, ponding roofs even. Uh, we're designing roofs that will uh, retain water to limit the stormwater runoff and then re-aspirate that into the atmosphere. So we're taking, bringing new challenges to our, even our existing knowledge of cladding systems. Uh, media walls, you know, all kinds of fantastical things inside the cladding of buildings. Uh, so we need a system uh, and a process to make sure we get what we're, we're asking for. Complex cladding systems can lead to water leakage, air leakage, there's a whole gamut here. Um, and then ultimately you're into rework and repairs uh, and failures. Every building enclosure person likes to have their uh, failure, uh, failure slide, so this is my failure slide. So these are you know, buildings that are not very old, some of them are not very old, actually all of these are uh, less than five years old, and seeing fairly gross material and system failure on buildings that were designed well, uh, constructed well, um, but had some issues in service or weren't constructed well or had some challenges that were not resolved as part of that construction process. Uh, wood rot, condensation, a lot of thermal bridging, um, leakage through the windows. Again, this is an intensive, this is a uh, bottom slide there, intensive care unit, uh, less than five years old with water sitting on the windowsill. I mean, these are our most vulnerable people and we're putting them in buildings that are not performing well. Um, time is running quickly. Uh, so, building enclosure commissioning, uh, or sorry, what is commissioning? Everyone's probably familiar with commissioning from a mechanical electrical perspective. We're taking that principle and applying it to the building enclosure. Um, ASHRAE guideline zero has the definition of commissioning um, and it talks about building commissioning, uh, retro commissioning and recommissioning. So retro commissioning and recommissioning are sort of interchangeable uh, terms. I wanna make sure I sort of set the framework as well for what's enclosure engineering, what is enclosure consulting and what is enclosure commissioning. Because again, these are often terms that are bantied about or thrown around assume they mean the same thing or you have a concept of what it might be. Um, this is not necessarily the definition. You won't find this in a textbook. I'm just trying to put a bit of a framework around it so that we have common terminology and can at least begin the conversation. I see these as three very different things. Um, different levels of involvement uh, and different skill sets, uh, different timelines, different costs, the works. Uh, typically, the enclosure, oh boy, the enclosure commissioner is tied to the owner, so they're the owner's representative. The enclosure consultant typically is on the other end of the team, so they could be tied to the designer, they could be uh, just one of many consultants that are part of the design team. You could also have an inspection and testing firm that's tied to the contractor, um, or you could be the enclosure engineer, where you're again more closely tied to the designer. So there are different spots for these roles. The commissioning agent is usually the one who's there from beginning to end. The consultant might be one who comes in, does a task, and is then no longer part of the process, or is there from the beginning to end. So it's not necessarily uh, set in stone uh, for, for enclosure consultant, but the commissioner is the one who's there from the beginning to the end. Not that these two are at odds with each other, we're just using arrows to show, you know, different sides of the, of the picture. 
The enclosure commissioner is a third party agent. So that is a person who is contracted and responsible reporting to the owner. Uh, and they are involved throughout the design and construction process. The enclosure consultant, as I said before, is typically retained on the design side. Uh, and as part of that design process, uh, but usually can provide very specific input or very uh, strategic input. They may not be involved through the whole project. They may be different from the inspection and testing firm. They may have, I, I, was, just in, I was involved in a project we're nearly closing out where I'm the building enclosure consultant for the below grade waterproofing, at grade waterproofing, the podium building enclosure and all the roofing, but not the curtain wall and not the windows. So, you know, you can slice and dice it however you want, um, but just to sort of show you that uh, uh, the difference between commissioning and consulting, they're different roles. Enclosure consulting, again, I, I won't reiterate it, but uh, you're there supporting the design team. You're there uh, as a consultant, the commissioning agent. You are there to verify that the owner's project requirements are being met by the design and the construction of that project. Um, and you're there for the, that verification process. So again, it's a process, it's from beginning to end. There are lots of guidelines uh, to help understand commissioning, to help determine the process um, and the people who should be involved. Here is a list of some of them. Uh, typically, we focus on CSA Z320. That's the one in the middle. Uh, it is an excellent guide. Uh, it has very specific requirements. Um, one thing that I would highlight too is ASTM 2813 uh, has, it's, first of all, it's, a, it's an ASTM standard, so you could put it in a spec and it is a standard that uh, is required to be met, uh, whereas some of these others are guidelines and guidelines have things like shall or may or these types of languages, but the ASTM standard is a standard. Um, the nice thing is about ASTM, which I think ties in well with Z320, is that it includes requirements and definitions for basic and enhanced commissioning. So if you are following a lead program or if you're familiar with that terminology and you say, I want my building to uh, follow Z320 with the requirements of fundamental commissioning from ASTM 2813, you're going to get a standard of service. That's something that is kind of knowable and definable, whereas commission, enclosure commissioning is still a little gray in the market. It's not really a well-defined scope or service. Lead version four includes building enclosure commissioning, not as one point, but two points. So like we're moving up in the world here. Uh, and this is an enhancement over fundamental commissioning. Uh, so where we had the durable building credit, which was one credit, uh, Lead version four has enclosure commissioning, which is an enhancement of uh, mechanical electrical commissioning to incorporate the building enclosure, uh, as well as some of the other things that are different between enclosure commissioning and mechanical electrical commissioning. So I've used these two terms before, owner's project requirements and the basis of design. And this is, um, this is just an example of two things that might show you the difference between those two terms. For the owner's project requirements, the owner is saying, I want this for my energy consumption goal. Uh, whether it's a certain equivalent kilowatt hours per meter square per year or something like that. This is my tolerance for leaks. So if you're the uh, client of the architect in Boston who says, you know what, you're going to get some leaks because you want a building that no one else has, then you, that needs to be set up front, clearly stated as part of the commissioning process. Sure, I'm tolerant of leaks. I haven't quite heard that yet in my business, but uh, you know, it, it's possible. Uh, the basis of design takes those owner's project requirements and turns them into performance requirements. So I changed this. Uh, I, you may have seen me up here fiddling with my slides. I had a different kind of roofing system in there, but now I have two-ply mod bit with fluid applied cap sheet. Because I'm thinking like this is, you know, we're going for the 66 year roof or whatever it is. So, um, and I put fluid applied flashings in there to sort of like, I didn't put Tremco, but I could add that in the next iteration. Yes. Um, so it's taking the owner's project requirements and it's putting them in there as a basis of design criteria, performance metrics. So as a commissioning agent, you're always going back to these documents to verify that that design that's on the paper is meeting these documents and these requirements. Uh, well, 
sorry, I'm going to just, I'm going very quickly and I realize I'm running out of time. Uh, so the commissioning process, again, it starts in schematic design, follows all the way through construction documents, construction phase, and occupancy and operations. So there is a, there is a follow-on pr process to take you all the way through to the end of construction, uh, as well as a training process. So at the end of a project, we give training sessions to building operators to say, here's the type of cladding system you have, here's the type of roof you have, here's the type of waterproofing system you have, here's the type of maintenance you need to do on each one of those systems, oh, and here's a bunch of checklists you can use every year to say, yes, I've done all that stuff, and you can send them to us and we'll review them. So that is part of the commissioning process, training and ongoing maintenance, and that is written into the commissioning plan. Uh, again, another list of OEM manuals, uh, various functions of the commissioning agent. This is, this is not the be-all and end-all of commissioning, but it is certainly part of commissioning. Physical, functional performance testing on site of products and installed systems. Uh, I won't sing this one out to you, but this, again, it's taking fundamental commissioning for mechanical, electrical, and applying it to building enclosure, and then adding a whole bunch of building closure specific commissioning tasks. Commissioning is not a replacement for good design. These are kinds of the things that commissioning is not. Um, commissioning is not just a spray rack and a test at the end of the job. So it's not coming in and doing a blower door test and an infrared scan and saying, great, your building's commissioned, congratulations, here's your piece of paper. It's different than that. It's a process from start to, to end. It has a fairly well uh, defined, um, defined process. Uh, and um, it is not something that uh, you just sort of come in and tick box at the end that you did. The last slide, again, fairly simplistic, but really as the project complexity increases, the value of commissioning increases. Commissioning is also not a one-size-fits-all process. I would not say that a uh, commissioning process that we would implement for a 50-story commercial office downtown is the same process that we would implement for a two-story strip plaza in Markham. It's not the same. Those are different to building types, different environmental situations, uh, different lows, different occupancies. Everything is different about those, so the commissioning process should be different as well. The, um, so, but I would say as the building gets more complex, the value of commissioning uh, becomes more apparent. Yep. Thanks.